please. Allora, buongiorno a tutti, io mi chiamo Maria Gianniti, sono una inviata della RAI e, e ringrazio il Festival Internazionale del Giornalismo per dedicare anche quest'anno uno spazio all'Egitto. È uno spazio importante perché dà l'idea uh, di quanto ancora si debba raccontare uh, su questo Paese. E lo scorso anno c'era stata un'attenzione particolare, come potete immaginare, sulla, sulla morte, la tragica morte di Giulio Regeni, che però purtroppo, soprattutto se questa cosa viene vista dall'Egitto, è, uh, è soltanto uno dei casi gravissimi che uh, si registrano in un paese appunto come, come l'Egitto. E allora oggi per parlare di quello che sta accadendo in questo paese Ehm, abbiamo scelto di avere ospiti due persone che vivono lì o meglio che hanno vissuto nel secondo caso e quindi ve li presento subito Declan Walsh che è il corrispondente del New York Times e Beltru che invece fino a poco tempo fa era la corrispondente per il do you have the translation? Uh, oh you don't so uh, credo che devo chiedere informazioni perché credevo che non c'era la, la, la traduzione per loro Ok, so... No, well, it matters. <laughs> Because we... No, scusate un attimo perché ero convinta che loro avessero la uh, cuffietta. Loro non hanno, uh, loro non ce l'hanno però. Ecco, allora scusate un attimo, diamo un attimo a loro la, la cuffietta. Eh, no, perché appunto è importante che anche loro, eh, perché altrimenti devo fare la doppia traduzione, e così evitiamo di fare le domande, domande in, in inglese. E, quindi eh, stavo dicendo, quindi è importante che questo racconto, per dire veramente che fase sta vivendo l'Egitto, arrivi proprio da persone che lo vivono, lo vivono sul campo. I will make a translation for you, Berlin, uh, waiting for it. Your headphones, I'm talking about how to tell what is going on in Egypt through first sight, that's what you do. So, eh, a questo punto credo che sia importante, eh, possiamo avere un altro, scusate, possiamo avere un'altra uh, cuffia microfono per... Arriva, sta arrivando, grazie. Be patient, just a second, She's, it's arriving for you. Um, quindi eh, entriamo subito nell'argomento a questo punto perché io vorrei, proprio perché abbiamo qui um, Declan Walsh, eh, che è appena arrivato dall'Egitto e quindi ci può dare subito uh, una, una panoramica su quello che è l'Egitto oggi considerando quello che è successo nelle ultime settimane perché, lo dobbiamo ricordare, ci sono state delle elezioni presidenziali che hanno visto ovviamente uh, l'acclamazione del nuovo faraone, forse lo possiamo anche chiamare così, eh, e cioè il generale Al-Sisi, quindi che ha inaugurato adesso il suo secondo mandato, però insomma delle elezioni che sono arrivate anche dopo settimane eh, di grande repressione, di arresti, di fra l'altro esecuzioni capitali, insomma c'è stato una, un aumento di eh, violazioni importanti, purtroppo ecco vi devo dire che stiamo cercando di contattare, sicuramente l'avrete visto nel programma, doveva partecipare, dovrebbe speriamo ancora, eh, partecipare a questo pane anche, panel anche Male Cadli che è un avvocato per i diritti umani che segue ovviamente tutti i vari casi di eh, sparizioni forzate eh, e non solo eh, però stiamo avendo delle difficoltà a metterci in contatto con lui via Skype teniamo le dita incrociate speriamo di riuscirci nel corso di questo panel eh, Malek non poteva essere presente qui eh, perché ha un divieto di viaggio non si può muovere dopo aver, essersi fatto anche diversi eh, mesi in prigione nel 2016 ecco lui non può lasciare le e quindi la sua partecipazione può essere solo ed esclusivamente via Skype, eh, ma non di persona. In caso non riuscissimo a collegarci con lui, ovviamente tratteremo questo argomento con i due ospiti che abbiamo qui. Allora io entrerei subito nel vivo con Declan. Declan, se ci puoi aiutare un po' a descrivere qual è la situazione, come sono state queste elezioni, che cosa le hanno anticipate e qual è la situazione oggi in Egitto, anche sul fronte di violazione dei diritti umani. Prego. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, so the situation in Egypt at the moment is that we've just been through an election. Um, it's Egypt's third presidential election since the Arab Spring in 2011. Um, 
The result was never in doubt. The result was not a surprise. President Sisi won with 97% of the, of the votes. Um, he had taken a number of steps in the run-up to the election uh, to ensure that there would be a, a margin of that magnitude. Uh, there was one other candidate. Um, his name was Musa Mustafa Musa. Musa I'm sorry, Musa Mustafa Musa. Um, and this is a gentleman who was a, a complete political nobody. Um, he was unknown to most Egyptians. Um, he had previously been a sort of pro-regime agitator uh, during the rule of President Hosni Mubarak. Um, and he was effectively um, pulled out of a closet at the 11th hour, about half an hour before the nominations uh, closed, um, in order to avoid the embarrassment of uh, a one-horse race, effectively. So, um, certainly, I guess, from the perspective of Egyptians, it was not a glorious exercise in democracy. And I suppose it was a pretty dispiriting exercise for people who had, for those Egyptians who had risen in 2011 during the Arab Spring, to uh, overthrow Hosni Mubarak, um, that they're now at a situation in terms of democracy where um, uh, things have arguably gotten worse in many respects than they had then. There have been also some arrests of uh, candidates uh, and or candidates that withdraw before the election. So that's probably also something that to point out. That's right. Yeah, there were not only was there just one candidate, but there were a number of people who tried to stand against uh, President Sisi, um, all of whom were either marginalised, sidelined, or in a number of cases jailed. Um, and in a sense, actually, that was the, the most interesting story out of this election um, was not about the process of the voting, um, but it was about the hidden currents that it seemed to expose. Um, two of the candidates, three of the candidates who stood against President Sisi were people who either uh, were, for were either former or serving military officers. Um, one of them was a former chief of the general staff of the Egyptian army, um, another had briefly served as Prime Minister in 2011, um, and he also had served in the, in the Air Force before. So these were people who came, at the very least, from the sort of ruling establishment in, in Egypt. Because there's no, there are no political parties as such, um, President Sisi leans very heavily on the sort of, what you might broadly call the military establishment to, under, to undermine his authority. And so these people who stood up to stand against him came from that establishment. Now, he um, and, his, uh, and the authorities, they snuffed out these candidates extremely quickly. Uh, one of them, a gentleman called Sami Anand, the former army chief, he announced his candidacy on a Saturday, and I think by Tuesday he was in a, in a jail cell. So, you know, they, they didn't get much, they didn't certainly get much air, if you like, to make their, to make their case. But the fact that, um, you know, the government responded so quickly and so harshly seemed to suggest, or certainly there were people who looked at this and they thought, okay, does this mean that there are people within the establishment who at least feel a little uncomfortable with some of the things that President Sisi has done, if not more? And that's actually the story of Egyptian politics at the moment because there are, there, you know, there's, no free, there's very little limited free speech, there are no political parties, that really people who watch this seriously are reduced to this game of sort of reading the tea leaves, you know, talking behind closed doors, trying to figure out what's going on in this very sort of opaque world of um, Egypt's ruling elite. E c'è una difficoltà chiara eh, anche da parte dei media internazionali eh, lavorare in Egitto. Eh, proprio prima delle elezioni, e eh, Declan su questo ha proprio scritto, pochi giorni prima, qualche settimana prima delle elezioni, eh, ci sono state delle, delle, il governo, se possiamo definirlo così, il governo egiziano ha stabilito delle regole molto ferre eh, per quanto riguardava anche la copertura da parte dei media internazionali, anche perché c'era stato un caso un caso di un interessantissimo documento pubblicato dalla BBC, eh, Orwa Demo, eh, scusate, ehm, dal, sì, 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 dalla BBC, eh, di un, un documentario, un reportage su quelle che sono le sparizioni forzate, che ha eh, creato eh, un gran caos, un gran caos e quindi immediatamente anche i media internazionali hanno incominciato a essere un po' nell'occhio del uh, ciclone e eh, ci sono state delle espulsioni e qui proprio su questo uh, palcoscenico c'è eh, una vittima di questa espulsione cioè Bell e ci terrei che lei raccontasse che cosa è accaduto a febbraio, che cosa le è accaduto a febbraio. Bell. 
Um, well, yes, as, as was said, I was a, a sort of victim of this. Um, I've been living in Egypt for seven years um, since the 2011 revolution, and before that I used to come backwards and forwards to Egypt. So I worked out yesterday that I've lived under five presidents in Egypt, which just goes to show um, how fluid the situation is. But I was arrested after I did an interview, threatened with a military trial, and deported. I just want to add a quick disclaimer in here before I continue. Um, I found it very hard to do any interviews since I was deported in February, um, mainly because of security reasons, but also because I don't want the narrative to be dominated by the idea that white Western journalists have the toughest time. Clearly, Egyptian journalists are under much harsher restrictions. Many of them have been forcibly disappeared or jailed or tortured or slapped with travel bans like Malik Adli. So I just want to make it clear that I'm not trying to make this about, you know, woe is me because I'm a, a white person who got chucked out of Egypt. But I think my story is an important indicator about how Egypt is right now. Um, because I was a long-serving member of the journalism community, what happened was so harsh and random. So what happened with me is in February, I went to do an interview in a small street cafe in a uh, location in Cairo. It was an uncontroversial interview, so I wasn't worried. I was looking into um, the migrant crisis. Uh, some Egyptians in 2016 had tried to make it to Italy, and this particular boat had probably sunk. Um, and the story was more about Europe's lack of response to looking after migrants and looking for those people who are missing rather than it was about the Egyptian state. I got into a taxi after the interview and it was forcibly pulled over by a minibus full of six plain clothed police officers. In Egypt, um, as Declan was sort of highlighting, um, there's a lot of pressure on journalists. Uh, we're used to being pulled to the side, questioned by security forces. It normally lasts a few hours and you're on your way. So I wasn't worried, but I did send a location stamp of where I was to a friend and, and the name of the police station just in case. The initial problem was about my press card, and the reason I'm mentioning that is because as part of the crackdown on international local journalists is playing with the concept of accreditation. It's April right now in 2018, and as far as I'm aware, international journalists have not been given their 2018 press cards, is that right? Yeah. So they leave you in a grey area where you don't have proper accreditation, but you do, and everything is fine until there's a problem. So I'd actually called the press centre the day before I was arrested and said, is everything okay? And they said, yes, you can use your 2017 press card. So this is an important part of the story I'll come to later. But when I was in detention, I actually called the press centre and said to them, is there a problem? And they talked to the police and said no. But things seemed to escalate. Um, the problem about being arrested in Egypt is you never know what's going on. National security was called in, which is one level above the police station, who's quite aggressive with me. They wanted to know what I was writing about. There were all these rumours circulating that I had been looking into enforced disappearances, which is sadly what Malik Adli was supposed to be talking to us about, which is a major issue in, in Egypt. Just to highlight the numbers, 1,500 people have been forcibly disappeared in the last four years at least. So that means people just vanish, usually into horrible jails and prisons. So they thought that that's what I was working on. They actually had the audio recording of my interview. Um, and I gave it to them and I said, please listen, Fadl, there's no problem, uh, which they didn't. Eventually, there was a police report and I found out that an informer in a cafe had informed on me. And that's quite common in Egypt now too. We're constantly being monitored as journalists. They accused me of defaming the state, which is a criminal charge in Egypt, over a different uh, story. Again, the police weren't interested in finding out the truth. They also refused me access to a lawyer and an embassy official, which should be my legal right at that point. They then said um, that, that my embassy wanted to, to deport me, which I know is illegal. And at this point, the police have been lying to me all the way through. So I didn't even know if anyone knew where I was or if I had been arrested. And this is actually really important in terms of the, the point about enforced disappearances, because this is how it happens. You get arrested, you end up in a police station, no one knows where you are. And the police usually lie to family members or concerned colleagues about whether they're in the police station or not. And that's sadly probably what would have happened to possibly to Julia Regeni. He would have been bundled into a police van and disappeared. And that certainly is what happened to me. Embassy official came to the police station and they were told I wasn't there, even though I was upstairs. So I know this was happening as it was happening to me and they wanted to put me in a police van, um, which I was really against because again, if they move me from the police station, then I have vanished. Um, and also at this period, um, most detainees are very badly treated in those police vans. And if you're a woman on your own, you're very often the victim of sexual violence. So I didn't want to get in that police van. I knew that if I left the police station, they wouldn't know where I was. I didn't know if anyone had raised the alarm. And the police officers that were with me were behaving very strangely. They were mocking me. They were filming me. They were becoming quite aggressive. So I was very concerned about the threat of sexual violence. 
As it turns out, my friends, my wonderful friends, know the system very well, and they'd posted someone to the police station to watch because they knew they'd lie about where I was. So the message was conveyed back to my embassy um, that I had been moved, and there were people actually driving around Cairo looking for me. And so I was thankfully okay. Uh, they did drive me around in this van for a while, but eventually they took me to the airport. And that's where I was told that I was going to face a military trial. This is another issue that's really important in Egypt. Civilians face military trials. Um, military trials are... Uh, you have one military judge, usually one session, no legal representation. Um, you're usually sentenced, as I said, after one sentence, you, uh, one session, you're usually given long jail sentences, maybe life in sentence or even the death penalty. It's usually reserved for terrorists or members of the military or high profile critics of the regime. In fact, yesterday, um, the campaign manager of Samia Nan that uh, uh, Declan was uh, mentioning, he was, actually he was actually sent to military trials. So that gives you an idea of how serious it is. And essentially, I had that choice, either face military trial, and they said they'd make a case up against me, that was, to quote the Interior Ministry, or get on a plane, so I did, in the clothes that I was wearing. I still haven't been able to get hold of my belongings. So the, the first question most people ask is, what did I do wrong? And I had actually followed the rules for the last seven years, and, um, and I'm ashamed to admit I actually had practiced self-censorship to a certain extent in the lead-up to my arrest, and I think many journalists now do. Um, because we hadn't had our press cards, because the presidential elections were coming, I was keeping a tab, you know, I was keeping my reporting down a bit. I didn't want to do anything too inflammatory. The state, the state said in their statement about me that I didn't have a press card, but in the same statement, they actually attached a photo of my presidential elections pass, because after I was deported, they actually accredited me to cover the presidential elections, even though I couldn't physically attend them. So they also said I was filming without a camera, uh, sorry, without a permit, even though I was arrested without a camera. I think the arrest was random, but I think I was used as an example, um, eventually, to basically threaten the press. And it did freak people out, because I'd never had a problem with the state before. I hadn't been on their radar. I had accreditation. I had a visa. I'd followed the rules as far as I possibly could in this shifting landscape where the goalposts move over time. Um, and since the crackdown, uh, there has been an uptick in, in attacks on, on the media. I know that Declan has faced a lot of pressure. The New York Times has come under a lot of um, criticism from the state. Over a particular article, I think you wanted to talk about the voter yes. bribery article, um, which, so maybe I'll hand the, the floor back to you about this. Sì, eh, c'è un articolo interessante che ha scritto uh, Declan uh, subito dopo le elezioni, quando ancora si era in attesa dei risultati, eh, sul fatto che ci fosse in qualche modo un voto di scambio, cioè eh, eh, gli egiziani venivano invitati ad andare a votare e in cambio veniva dato qualcosa. Dobbiamo ricordare che il livello di povertà in Egitto è, è, è altissimo e quindi c'è il 60% se non sbaglio della popolazione egiziana che vive al di sotto della linea di povertà e quindi potete immaginare ricevere un aiuto in cambio del voto che cosa significa e allora vorrei che Declan ne parlasse però approfitterei al di là di questo articolo vorrei che poi Declan ci aiutasse anche a capire eh, visto che appunto non riusciamo a metterci in contatto con Malek, quanto sono aumentate anche le sparizioni forzate e soprattutto che c'è stato un incremento preoccupante delle esecuzioni capitali proprio eh, a ridosso delle elezioni eh, presidenziali. Declan. That's right, so this problem of uh, uh, in what human rights groups called enforced disappearances has been steadily rising over the last, uh, certainly since I've been in Egypt. Actually, I remember when I arrived in Egypt, which was in late 2015, that was when the first cases one started hearing about. It was a relatively new phenomenon then, and now it's really become rampant. So, um, as Bell is explaining, I mean, what happens is people are taken into custody, usually by some security agency, and then there's no legal process. So, uh, their lawyers don't know where they are, their families don't know where they are, and they're held in detention centers uh, that in some cases people don't know exist, people may not even know where they're being held, and, you know, abuse, torture, intimidation, pressure, these are all things that are common in these places. And people can be picked up for any reason, frankly. Uh, you know, I mean, we've written and spoken to people who have disappeared uh, because they've been politically involved. We've also spoken to people who've disappeared because of what they wrote on their Facebook page, or because of their social media posts, or because of where they hang out. Or indeed, of course, for many other reasons. I mean, because because they're in a place where gay people are no, known to hang out, for instance. Um, there was a whole... There has been recently a strong crackdown towards the gay yeah, community. Yeah, so there, there, was a, there was an incident last autumn where uh, there was a, a concert by a very famous uh, Lebanese band called Mashrulela. Um, the lead singer of Mashrulela is openly gay, 
and has you know, spoken about that. It's part of his public uh, persona, if you like. Um, and so during his concert in Cairo, which by all accounts was a great concert, uh, some people um, started waving the rainbow flag. Uh, and this is actually very typical of how things work now in Egypt. So the, 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 these people waved the rainbow flag. Uh, people took photographs of that. The photographs were posted on Facebook, and then that's really where things go wrong. Um, the photographs are on Facebook, uh, it, it circulates fast, and then people who are either watching this or who want to make an issue out of this start getting outraged. That filters into the TV stations. Uh, the TV stations, the private channels, are all pretty much under the control of the government in one form or another. So then they start to drill up or to... Um, uh, create public outrage about this issue. And then people start filing court cases. In Egypt, if you're a private citizen, you can uh, instigate a court prosecution against anybody. Uh, and if the prosecutor agrees, then suddenly you're in the newspaper as someone who's facing, ch who's facing tr uh, charges. Um, we can, I can speak to this because we've actually faced this as well. Um, and, so, and, then, and then that public reaction uh, triggered a police operation. Uh, the police have always, uh, certainly under President Sisi, and of course before, but certainly under President Sisi, the police in Egypt have put the uh, gay community under a lot of pressure. Um, there are constant efforts to entrap people, particularly using social media applications, and, uh, dating applications and so on. Um, but that really stepped up to a new notch that people had not seen probably in a couple of decades, and many gay people were picked up. And some of those, just to go back to the original point, and some of those people disappeared for days without end, without anybody knowing if they'd been charged. So, um, you know, human rights groups have estimates of how many people are missing and so on, but by nature these things are provisional. It's very hard to get good information. Um, people are afraid to speak out, even if they're a victim. Um, and just to go to your earlier point where you talked about a BBC article um, or a BBC documentary about human rights in Egypt um, that appeared about one month before the election. It was done by the um, outgoing correspondent Orla Giran. Uh, Orla had done a story that spoke to uh, the mother of a woman who had disappeared. So the mother gave a very uh, emotional testimony about the mistreatment that her daughter had suffered and how she was missing. Um, the Egyptian government was extremely unhappy with this entire film um, and there was a lot of you know, pushback about it in the press initially. And then, hey presto, you know, two days later, they produced on one of these private TV channels the woman who had disappeared and she was sort of sitting there slightly looking like, you know, someone in a hostage video. Um, and she started to say that she was actually fine and she was sitting beside a man who she said was her husband and the man was holding a child. Um, and they said that they were sitting at home, but then it, they were, then there were references made and it turned out they were actually sitting in the interior ministry. Um, and they gave this interview where they basically, you know, denounced effectively the BBC report. And then the government seized on this and launched an absolutely unprecedented, um, you know, campaign against the BBC saying that this disproved the entire documentary, that the allegations of human rights abuses in Egypt made by the international press and specifically the BBC are completely wrong. And to be honest, it became slightly surreal at one point, the number of press releases we were getting about this documentary, the, um, and also just how murky everything became. You know, wh who was this woman? H how did she suddenly appear? What was this story? Um, and as ever in Egypt these days, it's very difficult to get to the truth. Um, tornando invece a quell'articolo che menzionavo prima a proposito del fatto che ci sia stato in qualche modo il vuoto di scambio, ecco, che cosa hai potuto verificare uh, tu durante la copertura delle elezioni appunto in questo, e, e hai raccontato in questo articolo uscito alcuni giorni dopo di come appunto le persone venissero portate a votare e se non fossero andate a votare addirittura eh, venivano multate, questo era il rischio che correvano. E che cosa è successo anche dopo la pubblicazione? Di questo articolo. Um, so, as I said earlier, the, you know, the point about the election is that there wasn't much of a contest. So, the question, the, the, the goal for the government, if you like, was to get a high turnout. Um, there had been, I think, 47% turnout in the previous election when President Sisi was uh, first 
elected as president in 2014. And so the government wanted to get a, a similar turnout to give this, you know, effectively one horse race some legitimacy to show that, okay, maybe there wasn't a serious contest, but many, many Egyptians wanted to turn out and show their support for President Sisi to give him a mandate going forward. So um, on the second day of voting, we went to a town called uh, Tanta, which is in the Nile Delta, north of Cairo. And we just went to, I can't remember, four or five different polling stations just to see what was going on, talk to people, see, see, see what was going on. Um, and what we saw, certainly in uh, a couple of places, where there, were, uh, there was a, a, an election um, station, and then about 100 yards down the street, there was a table. And at the table, there was a bunch of people sitting wearing T-shirts, some of them with sort of campaign slogans, CC campaign slogans, and they were filling out pieces of paper to people who were going into the polling station. And so I said to them, you know, why, what are these pieces of paper for? And they said, well, we are giving people information about which polling station they need to go to. So I said, okay. And then we uh, walked away from it and we spoke to some of the people who'd taken these pieces of paper. And they said, no, we've come here because we've been told that if we vote, we're going to get a box of subsidized government food. And so clearly this was an effort, you know, it wasn't clear to us who was funding this particularly, but it did seem to be in favor of the CC campaign. And, um, you know, it turned out that this was not uh, uh, an isolated incident. This was also happening in many other places, in poor neighborhoods, in Cairo and other places. And it, it was one of many uh, tools that were used to try and get people to vote. So, you know, provincial governments would say, if you vote, we will give you better services. We will give you better electricity or roads. Um, in some cases, people who work in the public sector, because the public sector in Egypt is huge, people were told, you know, if you don't go out and vote, uh, if you don't take your time off work and go and vote, you know, you won't get your bonus this, 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 this month. People of pensions were told, if you don't, we, uh, one of my colleagues spoke to a pensioner who said that they were told that they wouldn't get their full pension payment in the month of April if they didn't vote. So there were multiple tactics used to, let's say, encourage people to vote. Um, and so we wrote, we wrote a story about this. To be, we weren't the only one. I mean, you know, the Associated Press, uh, Reuters, The Times, many, many, you know, news, art, uh, media outlets wrote about this. But, you know, clearly, um, you know, the government, which is, has just become extremely sensitive to the way the country is portrayed in the foreign press, uh, really took exception to this, uh, put a lot of pressure on Reuters for a story they wrote. Um, they put quite a lot of pressure on us in different ways as well. Um, and that's unfortunately kind of becoming the way it is now in Egypt because the local press is you know, so, uh, under such pressure, so compromised, and the government is very keen to give this uh, you know, impression of popularity and strength that the foreign press are really, I mean, we're not the only people, but I suppose we're probably the most prominent part of the media now that are doing critical coverage, and there seems to be a real concerted effort to stop that or to curtail it. Ieri sera c'è stato un panel molto interessante, um, un incontro molto interessante che ricordava l'inizio della rivoluzione siriana. E in Siria c'è un conflitto che dura da più di sette anni e durante questo incontro si è parlato anche di sparizioni forzate, di esecuzioni eccetera insomma quando si parla dell'Egitto, in Egitto non c'è un conflitto però come state ascoltando ci sono delle similitudini per certi versi ci sono tante sparizioni forzate, ci sono tante esecuzioni però lì c'è un uh, presidente, c'è un regime chiaro che tiene sotto controllo il paese, fra l'altro un paese che ha raggiunto se non sbaglio i 92 milioni di abitanti, almeno questo mi sembrava l'ultimo dato che avevo visto quando sono partita dal Cairo eh, su quel display che c'è <ride> sul Ministero del, della Popolazione, eravamo oltre i 20, 92 milioni. E Bell, ecco, Declan ha raccontato un po' come sono state queste ultime elezioni, ma Bell ha visto invece anche elezioni ai tempi di Mubarak, erano elezioni diverse, ecco, quindi ci può dire come sono cambiate anche rispetto alle elezioni che si potevano vedere prima della rivolta, prima della caduta di Mubarak, Bell? Well, absolutely, I mean, I... 
I, I know this word is bandied around a lot, unprecedented, um, but as someone who's been living in Egypt for seven years and who spent time in Egypt before, um, I think that the sort of tightening of space of freedoms, not just press freedoms, but all kinds of freedoms, that, that tightening of space, that stranglehold is unprecedented. I mean, I remember life under Mubarak. It was very difficult. Um, it was very difficult. People talked about, they felt like they were sleepwalking, but at least there were protests that were allowed to happen. They were cleared very, very quickly, but they could still happen. In the elections, there were Muslim Brotherhood members who won seats in the parliament, as independents, of course, but they still won seats. Mohamed Morsi himself was an MP. He's the president of Egypt who was ousted in 2013 and is now in um, solitary confinement in Torah prison and probably will never see the light of day again. So under Mubarak, it was, I'm not trying to suggest that it was some kind of glorious moment of democracy. Um, clearly, the Mubarak's uh, political party, the NDP, had control. Um, but there were political parties operating. There were some space for press freedoms, particularly if you were a Westerner. And as I said, protests could happen. But I think, you know, now, I mean, and I think about back to 2011 after the revolution, there were problems around that parliamentary election as well because there were clashes between protesters and uh, the security forces. But there was this amazing outpouring of um, political engagement. I mean, everyone had an opinion. There were political parties being built every day. I mean, political parties would have tents on Tahrir Square during protests in 2011, which would absolutely not be... I mean, you couldn't have a protest now anyway because of protest laws, but to have a political party actually join that and put up a tent with their slogans is, is amazing. But I think now is even worse than 2013. So 2013 was the military takeover, the ousting of Mohamed Morsi, as I spoke about. During that time, I mean, I think now is even worse than then. And during those days, I mean, over 800 people were slaughtered in a single day in the clearing of the Rabah pro Muslim Brotherhood sit-ins, including Mick Dean, who is a Sky News cameraman, who he was shot between the eyes. And of course, at that time, uh, Mahmoud Abu Zaid, or Shokan, who's a young photojournalist, he was arrested. He's still in jail now, 4.5 years later. He's facing the death penalty. Even in those days, operating as a journalist, I think my apartment was being broken into in 2013. Someone kept leaving cigarette butts in my toilet bowl, which is a classic. You know, we've been there. Uh, Plainclothes police officers would follow you around in the streets. There were curfews. But even then, I could talk about my opinion on social media. I could write my stories without fearing that I was going to be bundled onto a plane and threatened with a military trial. So I think at the moment, really, I mean, you know, it's not just journalists that are under threat. We talked a little bit about um, the LGBT community. To give you a statistic, 230 members of the LGBTI community have been prosecuted on debauchery charges um, over the last period. NGOs are under fire. Um, there's a new oppressive NGO law that was pushed through three years ago. That basically means effectively you can't operate in civil society without state oversight. There are still incredible um, human rights defenders like Malik Adli who are operating, but again, they have travel bans or they're in jail or they've been forcibly disappeared. A very important story is Ibrahim Matwali, who I'm sure that Malik would have wanted to mention. He was a, um, a lawyer whose son was forcibly disappeared. Um, he'd been trying to help with the uh, Julia Regeni case as a kind of unofficial um, advisor. He was on his way uh, to a UN working group talking about enforced disappearances in Julia Regeni's case, and he himself was forcibly disappeared. So the level of like, you know, violence on top of violence on top of violence, it, it's just, it's, it's, you know, it's extraordinary. And I think really we are in a new era. I don't think the crackdown, which included me and, you know, which includes foreign media and Egyptian media, is anything just linked to these elections. I I think it's a new era and that's been made very clear by the president himself. He made in a statement in, in March, he said, any media outlet that criticizes the security forces is effectively defaming the state and that is a treasonous action. That's been backed up by comments made by the prosecutor general who've ordered staff to look into fake news you know, accusations by media outlets. There's been tens of thousands of arrests since 2013. So, I mean, and, and I think it's important, the point I wanted to make is to realize that background when you read news coverage coming out of Egypt. I, I mean, people are trying extremely hard to get the truth out, but I think all of us would admit that we had to self-censor in some way or at least, you know, have had to sometimes make a decision not to publish a piece. And I think that's particularly true of TV and, and, and photographers because they find it very hard to get permits. And it's a point that I've been discussing with different journalists that the, that the readership needs to understand the level of pressure and monitoring and difficulty that people go through to put through these news reports and what can't be said. 
So, um, I mean, I, and I think I just wanted to sort of add really, uh, because we've been talking a lot about um, Western media, but like, you know, there are incredible Egyptians like Malik Adli who can't be with us today, who can't even get on a sky Skype to us today, who are still operating in Egypt. So, I mean, there's human rights defenders, there's filmmakers, there's artists, there's activists, there's LGBT members, and um, many of them have travel bans, and many of them are facing trial. And I think the fact that you know I was able to safely leave Egypt speaks to my privilege, um, as devastating as it was for me. So, ecco, so avete un po' un'idea di qual è l'Egitto oggi. Niente deve disturbare il grande manovratore, in questo caso il generale Al Sisi. Qualsiasi elemento di disturbo deve essere assolutamente silenziato. Giulio Regeni stava facendo una indagine, una ricerca sui sindacati indipendenti. I sindacati indipendenti potevano, possono tuttora essere potenzialmente una bomba che può eh, deflagrare e quindi uscire dal controllo in qualche modo eh, delle autorità. E Giulio Regeni si è trovato quindi eh, schiacciato in questo meccanismo, sappiamo che è stato prelevato, eh, è stato torturato e dopo nove giorni è stato ritrovato il suo corpo. Io credo che Declan Walsh lo scorso anno eh, abbia scritto forse l'articolo più completo eh, su quei giorni e anche su tutto quello che è, è arrivato dopo il ritrovamento del corpo di Giulio Regeni. In questo articolo fa eh, capire chiaramente una cosa, che ci sono anche... Eh, persone all'interno del Dipartimento di Stato americano che sanno chi c'è, che si conoscono i nomi e i cognomi dei responsabili non solo degli esecutori materiali ma anche dei, dei mandanti. E come potete immaginare è un argomento estremamente sensibile, l'articolo di Declan Walsh, questo lungo articolo di Declan Walsh è uscito due giorni dopo la notizia che l'Italia avrebbe fatto tornare eh, l'ambasciatore al Cairo dopo 16 mesi di fatto di crisi, di crisi diplomatica. Eh, si è scritto tanto ovviamente anche qui in Italia, ma a me interessa eh, sapere invece dal punto di vista di non un italiano, insomma non un egiziano, da un punto di vista di un americano, come è stata vista anche eh, questo ritorno dell'ambasciatore italiano e soprattutto eh, siete riusciti anche voi attraverso le vostre fonti a raccogliere qualche informazione in più sul caso di Giulio Reggeni? Well, you know, I guess the, uh, you know, the, the, uh... when, 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 after Giulio Reggeni was killed, um, I don't have to tell anyone here who lives in Italy about what the reaction was here and how much public pressure there was to try and get an answer about what happened to him. And for the Italian government, came out very strongly in the beginning, as you know, and said, effectively, you know, accused the Egyptian state of being responsible um, and started this process to try and have a joint investigation. And Egypt's, or sorry, Italy's um, point of leverage, or main point of leverage, really was to, with, with, was to ultimately was to withdraw the ambassador, Maurizio Masari. Masari. And um, you know that was that was an embarrassment to Egypt. You know, Egypt's, um, you know, even for the picture that we're portraying here, it's important to remember that you know, for instance, there are large parts of the Egyptian system, like people in the foreign ministry and so on, who have this, you know, proud tradition of themselves as a as the largest country in the Arab world, as a giant in the Arab world, as a center of diplomacy, you know, as a as a country that has an important place on the world stage. So for the Italian ambassador not to be president was an embarrassment, and they wanted it that done. Secondly, of course, there were large economic interests at play. Uh, you know, the Italian uh, state-controlled firm Eni was in the process of developing the largest gas field in the eastern Mediterranean in conjunction with the Egyptian government. So withholding the ambassador was a key piece of Italy's um, political leverage in this kind of dance that was going on to try and force some sort of little drop of truth about what was happening. And so, I guess, I mean, I don't, I'm not privy to why that decision was taken, obviously. Um, I, I, you know, Italian friends tell me that it was auspicious that the decision to send back the ambassador happened uh, on a very, on the eve of a big public holiday here in Italy, in, in August. 
So 15th of, August. 15th of August, you know. So, I mean, you could suppose that maybe someone wanted this piece of bad news to, you know, pass away quietly. You could suppose, I guess. But in any event, it happened. And, you know, I have to say that certainly from the perspective of someone living in Egypt, I mean, it seems that there was a huge sigh of relief on the part of the Egyptian system when the ambassador did go back and a sense that things would start, start to go back to normal. Um, you know, it seems, as I understand it, you know, clearly there was a negotiation behind the scenes where Italy said, okay, we will send back our ambassador if you do certain things. And those certain things, at least partly, uh, focus on this idea of the cooperation and the investigation and what Egypt would hand over in terms of material that would help the Italian prosecutors in Rome um, to learn the truth about what happened. But to be honest, so far, it seems to me that even though some material has been handed over and we see these you know, announcements periodically, someone travels to Cairo, someone comes here, there's an announcement that something's been handed over, we haven't seen many results yet to suggest that, that the Italian prosecutors have learned anything concrete about who's responsible specifically for Giulio's death or um, you know, what, what they can do about it. And I noted that there was a public statement by the prosecutor in January on the second anniversary of his death where the prosecutor said, um, you know, basically said in pretty bold language, you know, that the Egyptian security services were responsible for his death. Um, and to me, in a sense, that was not a sign of strength. That was probably a sign of weakness uh, on the part of the Italians because no longer now are they conducting this behind closed doors, but they don't have... They don't have like a name, they don't have a prosecution, so now they have to sort of go with these, you know, broad accusations, um, which of course in Egypt I'm afraid have just been, you know, shrugged off. I mean, the, the Egyptian authorities have, a, there's a long history in Egypt of the authorities very successfully burying embarrassing stories or embarrassing events by um, what they call in sport playing the clock. So they just string it out along and along, and they work, on the, they work on two assumptions. They work on the assumption, number one, that the other side are gonna get tired, or run out of steam, or run out of like emotion. Um, and secondly, they're working on the assumption that Egypt is a big, important country on the southern shore of the Mediterranean with almost 100 million people, um, you know, a giant in the Arab world, a bulwark against extremism, fighting a war against Islamic State, you know, along the route of migrants, huge economic potential, gas fields in the sea. And I think they're saying, well, you know, we're important. We don't have to, we don't have to bend to this. You know, we don't have to do it. Business is business. Però l'impegno che abbiamo noi eh, come giornalisti è comunque di mantenere alta L'attenzione sul caso di Giulio Regeni, non soltanto per Giulio Regeni, per i suoi genitori, ma anche per tutti i Giulio Regeni che ci sono in Egitto e questo è l'impegno fondamentale e in questo ci possono dare anche una grande mano i giornalisti stranieri e io a questo punto eh, lascerei a voi eh, la possibilità di fare delle domande eh, a Declan e a Bell, quindi chi vuole, ecco vedo una mano alzata lì in fondo. Raccoglierei un paio di domande se possibile in modo che così poi... Dove era la domanda? Eh, vedo. Ah, signore, eh, ecco, arriva yeah, il microfono. Yeah. One second. Buonasera, sono Claudio Felici. Volevo chiedere, riallacciandomi un po' alle dichiarazioni di un magistrato di un paio di settimane fa, cioè che l'Italia si trova in una situazione un po' scomoda per fare, eh, diciamo, chiarezza sul caso di Reggeni, visto che Abbiamo tanti Giulio Regeni anche in Italia, dei quali non si, non si sa che fine abbiano fatto, mentre erano custoditi dallo Stato. Quindi questo ha detto un magistrato. Inoltre ci sono quattro individui eh, dei pregiudicati che stanno in attesa che finisca eh, i cinque anni di interdizione per tornare a fare i funzionari di polizia qua in Italia, quindi questo magistrato giustamente, ci sono state tantissime polemiche, ha detto che l'Italia si trova in una situazione imbarazzante perché questi per quattro personaggi sembra, poi i giornalisti siete voi, quindi ditemi voi se 
sembra che, di cui non si è più parlato tra l'altro, sembra che tra poco torneranno a fare... Non stiamo parlando però del caso di Giulio Reggeni in questo caso qui. Ho scritto Giulio Reggeni. Sì, ok, ma allora eh, no, quello che... Eh, sì, capisco che è una, della, eh, è, una, esatto. è una domanda un po' scomoda lo no capisco. no no non è un problema di scomodità perché io cercavo di raccogliere domande a cui possono rispondere anche i nostri interlocutori no, quello a cui si riferisce lei sicuramente non si riferisce al caso di Giulio Reggeni si riferisce a un caso interno in Italia sì eh. ma riferito al caso Reggeni perché sì. il magistrato ha detto chiaramente che ha noi siamo esatto. in una posizione molto strana il problema per quanto riguarda beh, questo non, forse insomma non possono rispondere loro, cioè è ovvio che non è, non è paragonabile, non è par il caso di Giulio Regeni purtroppo ci siamo chiesti molto spesso noi giornalisti, eh, visti i casi che come ricordava anche lei ci sono in Italia, ai noi, quanto possiamo fare su un caso come quello di Giulio Regeni, però un conto sono le cose di casa nostra quindi possiamo fare pressione, un'altra cosa, un'altra situazione invece è quello di Giulio Regeni che è accaduto al Cairo e quindi quando ci si deve come dire, interfacciare con una procura che non è una procura italiana e a questo proposito il procuratore generale di Roma, Pignatone, credo che fosse proprio quello a cui si riferiva Declan eh, quando eh, parlava poco prima, eh, in occasione del secondo anniversario della sparizione di Giulio Regeni l'ha detto è complicato in Egitto, la strada è difficile, però è l'unica che possiamo percorrere. Ci dobbiamo adattare anche a quelli che sono i tempi dei, eh, degli inquirenti egiziani, non abbiamo alternativa e quindi dobbiamo in qualche modo eh, seguire quelli, eh, capire quelle che sono le possibilità che noi abbiamo in quel paese, ma questo per quanto riguarda i rapporti Italia-Egitto. Per quanto riguarda invece i rapporti interni in Italia, i casi italiani, non mi sento io di rispondere perché sono una persona che si occupa soprattutto di politica estera, non mi occupo di, non mi occupo di casi giudiziari qui in Italia, quindi purtroppo non posso rispondere, però possiamo soltanto raccogliere questa sua osservazione, insomma, no, ma non più di questo. Non so c'è qualcuno, non è, eh, c'è qualcun altro invece che vuole Altre magari... Le, le sì. raccogliamo? Che facciamo? Sì, magari, okay. grazie. Eh... Lui va bene? Avete visto qualcos'altro? No, non vedo altre mani alzate, Una. sinceramente. Volevo chiedere ai giornalisti che vivono in Egitto e che leggono la stampa egiziana. Di solito nei, nei governi durante i regimi autoritari, per sviare l'attenzione dai problemi interni, sì, ci sono fenomeni di scapegoating nei media. In Egitto qua, quali ci sono stati gruppi della società egiziana che vengono accusati delle malefatte... Eh, Vorrei, io ho letto su The Intercept che mi sembra la comunità gay è stata abbastanza colpita durante gli ultimi due o tre anni. Altri gruppi sono stati messi sotto la comunità Bai, ad esempio, o testimoni di Geova. Volevo sapere quali gruppi sono attaccati. Okay. Altre domande? Ci sono altre domande? La rac ne raccogliamo, sì. Okay. Grazie so much. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, to say first that uh, uh, we are aware the situation in Egypt, uh, the, the painting is quite black from what you've described. Um, first question is, what do you think it's still there for journalists, foreign journalists to do uh, in Egypt to uh, report repression? Uh, the second question is, uh, seeing that direct contact in conventional uh, journalism methods could expose Egyptians to threats. Uh, have you thought of using secure and anonymous whistleblowing uh, in the Times and the New York Times? Thank you. C'è qualche altra domanda? Ne raccogliamo una terza eventualmente. Ecco, vedo una mano alzata lì in fondo, quel ragazzo. Sì. E poi eh. facciamo rispondere. Sì, intanto vi ringrazio per la disponibilità. Io volevo chiedervi... Si dice, no, più un'opinione, se dietro eh, al silenzio negli ultimi mesi sul caso Regine ci sia anche un accordo a tre tra appunto l'Italia, la Libia e l'Egitto per quanto riguarda l'immigrazione, se si siano detti insomma vi lasciamo il tempo per, per fare le indagini, vi lasciamo tranquilli, intanto troviamo un accordo sull'immigrazione, quasi un, uno scambio di favore a vicenda per, per coprire il caso Regeni. 
se c'è un collegamento fra l'accordo fra Libia, Italia, Egitto per l'immigrazione e il silenzio sul caso, sul caso Regeni. Grazie. Ok, allora io darei subito la possibilità di rispondere, farei rispondere entrambi alle, alla sollecitazione perché fondamentalmente ecco, mi interessa questa cosa di gruppi che in qualche modo sono stati attaccati dalle autorità, ecco che cosa, che cosa vi risulta? The, particularly when you talk about the crackdown on the LGBTI community, the state loves to, scape, uh, loves to curry favor with an increasingly conservative public in Egypt by having high profile, often televised raids of cafes where you know, LGBTI people are supposed to hang out or even bathhouses. And that really, I mean, because the, co the country has become increasingly conservative, it does mean that, you know, that wins support for the security forces. Of course, another group that is always uh, scapegoated is the Muslim Brotherhood who were in power until Mohamed Morsi was ousted in 2013. Whenever anything happens, there's always some kind of Muslim Brotherhood conspiracy. There's also the foreign hand, and I think, you know, foreign journalists are often used as a good scapegoating group. Um, you know, we're trying to defame the country, uh, we're trying to bring Egypt down to its knees just at the moment when it's you know, witnessing a glorious moment of democracy because we want to, you know, have, we have colonial thoughts of how to rip the country up. And people genuinely believe that. There's a huge uh, propaganda a campaign that is done through local media, both privately owned and state media. And you see that on the streets. When you try and report, people don't want to talk to you. Um, there's a lot of aggression. I've faced physical violence by members of the community as these moments of xenophobia have gone up and down because of this kind of scapegoating and blaming the foreign media. And that certainly helps when things are tough. So, I mean, it's very difficult economically in Egypt. We haven't, just, we haven't uh, we've briefly touched on that, but um, there are a lot of people living under the poverty line. The, the Egyptian pound has been halved in value because it was floated. That's meant that inflation's gone up 40% um, for food. Subsidies have been cut. So people, to sort of, and then at the same time, we had this massive crackdown on the LGBTI community. So yeah, definitely the state can divert attention away from the woes um, by basically, you know, targeting whether it's, you know, gay people or the Muslim Brotherhood or foreign correspondents or different sects, you know, like the Shia as well. You know, it doesn't matter who it is. They're just useful as ways of like, just, you know, basically distracting. Declan, I would like you first also to answer about how difficult it is, because you're still in Egypt, how difficult it is now to report on repression, on the crackdown. Um, it, it's certainly challenging. Um, you know, but part of the problem is, as Bell was alluding to, just, you know, working on the street and in public has just become harder. Because for years, people now, Egyptians, I mean, you know, if we look, you know, Egyptians went through a very... Uh, you know, there, were, there was the Arab Spring, then in 2013 there was this great trauma, and there was a whole period where people appeared to be sort of, you know, retracting, and, uh, you know, they just wanted some peace. And at the same time, you have this media, uh, sort of, the government has really controlled the media and has pushed a certain message that people have been listening to, that their wolves are not because of the actions of the government, but they're because of the actions of, you know, foreigners, including the press and so on, who are out to do Egypt down. And the problem is that what, what, what that does is that on the ground, when you go out to talk to people, um, you know, they ha a lot of people have internalized that. So, you know, to run a security state, you don't necessarily need to have a policeman on every corner. If you control the TV stations, you can actually, you know, turn a lot of ordinary people, influence the way that they think about these things. And, of course, they're seeing fewer and fewer foreigners on the street. So then when one does go out there, in certain areas anyway, you stand out more. So that's, that's one practical problem. Uh, the other difficulty is that, you know, the, uh, the, the government has just become a lot more aggressive, as I said, in terms of... Um, you know, putting pressure on journalists with accreditation, with threats of legal action, sometimes with taking legal action, um, with intimidation of particularly local journalists, with uh, expulsion, you know. So we've really seen the kind of toolbox that the government uses to try and control the foreign media message has expanded and has been used with, with greater vigor. So, uh, yeah, that, that, you know, that's certainly a challenge. But, um, you know, we, we, we just take it story by story. In merito alla domanda uh, su se ci sia effettivamente un accordo tra Italia, Egitto e Libia eh, sulla questione immigrazione, sì, chiaramente c'è. Eh, fra l'altro il nostro ministro dell'interno, Menniti, 
eh, è andato a parlare direttamente con Al-Sisi proprio della questione Libia, ovviamente ha buttato lì anche il caso Regeni. Le nostre autorità continuano a dirci, ovviamente eh, il caso Regeni continua a essere top of the agenda in tutti i rapporti fra Italia ed Egitto, ma è chiaro che eh, l'Italia ha bisogno della sponda egiziana per quanto riguarda il controllo di parte di ciò che accade in Libia, sappiamo che cosa ha fatto il Ministro Minniti che è andato più volte a, a parlare con i vari eh, capi tribù per cercare di bloccare il flusso e questa è storia, questo è, sappiamo, è quello che è accaduto negli ultimi, negli ultimi mesi. Ora che il caso Regeni, che la verità su quanto è accaduto a Regeni sia stato messo come dire sia parte di questa trattativa è possibile, è quello che ovviamente eh, temono in particolare i genitori di Giulio Reggeni e, e per questo noi diciamo sempre dobbiamo in qualche modo essere parte attiva nel continuare a sollecitare una verità. Eh, da parte della Federazione Nazionale della Stampa Italiana insieme ad Amnesty International eh, proprio in occasione del ritorno eh, dell'ambasciatore italiano al Cairo il 14 settembre ci si è detti facciamo in modo che il 14 di ogni mese sia una data per chiedere che cosa c'è di nuovo sul, uh, sulla morte, sulle indagini sul caso di Giulio Regeni? Declan purtroppo ha, ci ha dato una risposta, se lo dice insomma, il corrispondente del New York Times, sono parole che pesano perché fin tanto che lo diciamo noi siamo troppo parte in causa, se lo dice invece un osservatore esterno pesano molto di più. Purtroppo i passi avanti non ci sono, i passi avanti non ci sono, eh, ci sono questi viaggi periodici no? degli egiziani, degli inquirenti egiziani che vengono da noi, inquirenti italiani che vanno in Egitto, però al momento grandi passi avanti non ci sono, la mia percezione così insomma da osservatrice che fin tanto che ci sarà al Sissi noi non avremo la verità, ma non è detto che quando non ci sarà più al Sissi ci saranno delle verità eh, da raccontare, il rischio reale è che il caso di Giulio come i tanti casi egiziani finiscono, finiscano nel dimenticatoio. Ci sono altre domande? Un'ultimissima perché poi dove ha Padre Janus? Yes, could, please. Could I just add something yes, very sure. quickly to that? Yeah. Just, just uh, to, uh, un attimo che facciamo... Just to follow on actually to the point you're making with the question the gentleman asked. I mean, if the deal is for Egypt to provide greater cooperation in the investigation for Giulio Regeni, I mean, I think it's important to always step back from the big picture and realize that there is really not much of an investigation to be had, ultimately. You know, this is an, a political matter now. There doesn't seem to be much doubt that, you know, senior people by now, at the very top levels of the Egyptian government, almost certainly know exactly what happened with Giulio Regeni. So to say that, you know, we are going to wait and we will, you know, provide time, allow space so that we can investigate further, i mean, it seems to me that there's probably not a whole lot of investigating to do. So it's, it, is, it, it has become effectively a purely political matter. Questo, questo che ha detto Declan di fatto lo ha detto anche il procuratore generale Pegnatone, il procuratore generale di Roma, ormai bisogna far muovere soprattutto la politica, noi facciamo quello che possiamo però è la politica che deve parlare. Parigliano, abbiamo proprio pochissimo tempo, prego. Io volevo solo sapere questo, che questa legge di, che Egitto gira come vuole e ancora prima di Morsi che era già così contro i giornalisti era così stretto oppure è una nu novità di nuovo presidente insomma di nuovo rieletto grazie um. I mean, I think I, I mentioned it before, but I mean, I, I was living in Egypt un, under Morsi before Morsi uh, during that whole period of time. And um, I'm not going to say that under the Muslim Brotherhood, it was somehow some glorious moment of democracy because it was tough. There was repression. There was uh, arrests. There was a protest movement against the abuse by the Muslim Brotherhood of activists in particular. I guess we use the word secular, though that's a difficult word. But no, it, it was no nothing like it is now. And before um, Mohamed Morsi, right now we're seeing an unprecedented crackdown. The fact that there are no political parties, that there is no proper presidential candidate uh, conten contender to CC, that um, there are no... Uh, Um, voices of uh, very few voices of, of dissent in Egyptian media that at least 500 news websites and NGO websites and human rights websites have been blocked that tens of thousands of people have, have been rounded up I mean I think the numbers are just huge it, it's unprecedented right now